This is a cable landing station in Marseille, France. From the outside, it appears nondescript, but underneath the surface, it connects to a vast data network comprising 95% of the world's overseas internet traffic. As of 2021, the Marseille facility connects to 16 major undersea cables, serving areas as diverse as Hong Kong, Singapore, India, Oman, Egypt, Greece, Britain, Portugal, Nigeria, and South Africa. Worldwide, there are over 1,400 landing sites like Marseille, connecting some 500 active and planned cables. In total, the global network spans 1.4 million kilometers, roughly the sun's diameter. And even though the network provides seamless internet traffic across the globe, the supply, installation and maintenance of these cables are dominated by a handful of companies from the United States, France, Japan and, more recently, China. More than $10 trillion worth of financial transactions are transmitted via these cables every single day. Everything from Netflix programs to YouTube videos, top-secret diplomatic cables and military orders passes through this undersea network. No wonder the cable infrastructure is a geopolitical imperative. Now, China and America are leveraging every instrument of state credit available to wrest control and set the power parity for the 21st century. From military might to intelligence gathering, economic warfare and domestic and international law, Nothing is off the table because, when looking for expedient outcomes, ruthlessness is as good as strategy. In June 2017, Nick Warner, the head of Australia's foreign intelligence, went to the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. Australia had been in charge of the country since 2003 because they thought it was in trouble and needed help. Australian security people were in charge of the police and other important government stuff. Warner had been in charge of this before. And now he wanted to finish up one last thing. When he got there, he met with the leader of the Solomon Islands, Manasseh Sogavare. They talked about a new long cable, about 4,500 kilometers long, that would connect the capital city of Honiara to Sydney in Australia. This cable was a big deal for the area, and at first, a lot of Western countries and groups wanted to help with it. Even the Asian Development Bank was interested. But there was a problem. Sogavara chose a Chinese company called Huawei Marine to do the project, and this made Australia worried. The reason was that back in 2013, someone leaked secret information from the United States, and it showed that American equipment, like what Huawei had, could be used for spying. Western spy agencies were scared that China might do the same thing. Shortly after talking to Warner, Sogavar lost his job because of a vote that said he was doing bad things like corruption and taking bribes. In 2019, he got his job back and wanted to be friends with China in terms of security. But before that happened, the person who took his place, Rick Howe, who used to work for the World Bank, said no to Huawei and let Australia take over. This event, which most people don't really remember today, was one of the early fights in a bigger battle over the world's internet cables. These cables are super important because they make the internet work all around the world. But they have a weakness. Even though they're really long, they're not very thick, about the width of a garden hose. They have different layers and parts. On the outside, there's a layer of plastic to keep everything safe. Under that, there are strong steel wires for protection. Then, there's more plastic to keep water out, followed by more steel wires and plastic. In the middle, there's a tube made of copper or aluminum to protect the cable. Around all of this, there's a special tape to stop water from getting in. Finally, right at the center, there are tiny hair-like fibers that carry information with laser signals. But when the signal goes a really long way, it can get weaker. So they have to use a device called a repeater every 60, 70 kilometers to make it stronger again. Some people think these repeaters could be used for spying when they're being made or fixed. Others say that spy agencies can watch the cables at the places where they come ashore, like a gold mine for spying. Submarine cables are put in the ocean using special ships. There are about 50 of these ships in the world. So, working with these cables is a really specialized job. 
Sometimes, there aren't enough experts to go around, so even countries that don't get along might have to ask each other for help to fix their cables. It doesn't matter if it's a big, powerful country or a smaller one. They might still need help from someone they don't completely trust. When other people work on these cables, there's a risk that they could put in devices to steal or mess up the data going through the cable, which would be a big problem. So, when a new cable is made, it's like a move in a big world game. It can either bring countries closer together for safety or make someone feel left out. This is how we send information all over the world, and it's why these cables are so important. Compared to using satellites, which are way more expensive and can't carry as much data, cables are the way to go. Even though satellite technology might get better in the future, as of 2023, hardly any data goes through satellites for long distances, and that's not likely to change for a while. But there's a worry that these cables could be used for spying or get messed up on purpose. That's why some countries say only certain companies can put in or take care of these cables in their part of the ocean. Things used to be different. Governments usually paid for these cables. But in the 2000s, Chinese telecom companies like Huawei started going to places that didn't have good internet and helping them out. Then, Chinese telecom companies started doing their own thing in the cable business. By 2015, China started a project called the Digital Silk Road to make their network bigger. They teamed up with Huawei Marine, and in just four years, they got 15% of the whole world market for these cables. For the United States, this was like a wake-up call. It showed them that they needed to pay more attention to this stuff. The Trump administration got really tough on China. Submarine cables are a bit special because they mix together public and private stuff. This makes them important for national security and business. The US wanted to control these cables and make sure American companies were the leaders. Once these cables are in the water, the companies that run them can make money by letting other tech companies and internet providers use them. This can last for a long time, like several decades. Cables going to developing countries can also help American tech giants get into new markets, and the government can use these cables to spy on things. So, the government and businesses worked together. The government paid the big bills to make sure American companies got the contracts, not companies from other countries. Big tech companies like Google, Meta, formerly Facebook, and Microsoft have also joined in by investing lots of money in cables since 2016, about $2 billion, which is 15% of all the money spent on these cables around the world. These companies also use most of the world's internet, so by owning the cables, they get even more control. Because of this, Chinese cable companies didn't get many contracts. The US threatened to punish them, so two companies, Global Marine and Huawei, sold their parts of a joint project to another company called Hang Tong Group, which changed its name to HMN Tech. But by then, the damage was already done. Nowadays, HMN Tech only has two projects in Southeast Asia, and they won't be ready until 2024. So, the US was able to stop China from becoming a big player in the global cable business, at least for now. HMN Tech only controls 10% of the cables that are known about, which is way less than French company ASN and American company Subcom, who control 41% and 21% of the cables, respectively. But even though the US is good at planning cables, China is better at fixing them when they break. When a cable has a problem, it needs to be fixed fast. So, whoever can do the job quickly is the one who gets it. China has been taking care of the cables in its nearby seas, even the ones that belong to America and Japan. Some people think this could be a chance for spying. In 2022, Chinese ships fixed cables that belong to AT&T, Verizon and Microsoft in the East China Sea. Then, in May, Microsoft said they were pretty sure that hackers, maybe from China, got into their telecom stuff. China said they had nothing to do with it. Because of things like this, the US wants to keep new cables far away from China. They started something called the Clean Network Initiative in 2020, which basically says that cables shouldn't go directly from America to China. The results speak for themselves. 
the Bifrost and Echo submarine cables scheduled to open in 2024 bypass disputed waters near China, as does the Apricot Cable, a 12,000 kilometers project connecting to the Philippines and Indonesia, due for completion in 2025 in the Southwest Pacific. However, geopolitical factors are even more pronounced. In 2021, the World Bank scrapped a cable project connecting Guam to Micronesia, which Chinese HMN Tech was favored to win. Washington had essentially scuppered the project. In 2020, the State Department contacted Micronesia, expressing disapproval of Chinese involvement. Thereafter, Washington, Tokyo and Canberra announced they were funding a new cable along the same route. By June 2023, the $95 million, two, 250 km project was underway. In turn, this enhanced the status of Guam, a highly militarized overseas US territory as a major data hub. Hostility between America and China pushes companies to forge new routes along which to send data traffic. As national security and data security are prioritized, policy and regulatory frameworks are put in place that fully exclude hostile vendors from the entire ICT ecosystem. Singapore, Indonesia, the Philippines and the US island territory of Guam are now emerging as hubs for international data traffic. But competition also extends into the Indian Ocean. Here, a major friction point has been the CMEWI-6 cable running from Singapore to Paris. Initially, Chinese HMN Tech was favoured to build it. The company's bid was by far the most competitive. At $500 million, it was only one-third of the asking price, and the project was expected to raise HMN Tech's international prestige. Once more, though, Washington stepped in and implied that it would slap sanctions on the project. Predictably, this resulted in an about-face. The project was handed over to Subcom, a New Jersey firm with deep links to US intelligence. Subcom itself started life in 1955 as a Cold War project to enhance American anti-submarine capabilities. Nowadays, it develops cables for companies like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Meta platforms. Strategically though, its most important role is as the exclusive contractor for the US military, which it assists in monitoring the PLA Navy. Subcom is also in pole position to lay a new cable to Diego Garcia. The British-administered atoll hosts a 3,000-strong Anglo-American naval base. Its central location allows Washington to project power over vital sea lanes connecting West Asian oil producers with East Asian oil importers. Nowadays, the island serves not just as a naval base, but as a data nexus for the Five Eyes Intelligence Sharing Network, which connects the intelligence agencies of the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. On the other side, China's involvement in the Indian Ocean is not as big. They mostly invested in cables before they started having problems with their tech companies. One of the Chinese companies, China Mobile helped make the two Africa cable that connects Africa to Europe. Another one, China Unicom, put money into the sail cable, which is 5,800 kilometers long and connects Brazil to Cameroon. That one started working in 2020, but there haven't been many Chinese cables reaching Western countries recently. One rare example is the Peace Cable, which started in December 2022. It's a super long cable, 12,000 kilometers, and it connects Singapore, Kenya, and Pakistan to France. It goes through Egypt and Malta. Chinese companies paid for and built the whole thing, including HMN Tech. France said yes to the project because they wanted to be more independent when it comes to their internet stuff, especially with tensions between the US and China. But over time, splitting cables into separate networks can make them more tempting targets during a war. Even though some places like Ukraine try to use satellite internet to avoid problems with their cables, it's not really a good replacement, at least not for a few decades. What makes the conflict over these cables even scarier is that it's really hard to tell if something bad happening to them is on purpose or just an accident. And places where there are a lot of these cables, like the South China Sea, also have lots of boats and stuff going on underwater. 
Sometimes, anchors and fishing nets cause problems, and so do natural things like landslides and earthquakes. All of this can lead to misunderstandings and mistakes. For example, in early 2023, the internet went down on some islands controlled by Taipei, and within a week, the two main cables that connected the islands to Taiwan were cut. People thought China did it, but they later realized there wasn't any clear proof that China was involved or meant to do it. Another issue with these cables is that the rules for them in international law are not very clear or up to date. The US and China tried to make their own rules, but they weren't very good. The most recent American law about these cables is from way back in 1888. If someone breaks a cable, they could get fined $5,000 and go to jail for up to two years. If they mess up with anchors or fishing nets, they might only get a $500 fine and three months in jail, which isn't much of a punishment for something that can cost up to $3 million to fix. Chinese law, meanwhile, is inconsistently enforced. Beijing imposes penalties based on the degree of interference. Intentional or negligent cable damage brings a $400 fine, but operators can also be ordered to cease activity. Laying unauthorized cables also attracts a $28,000 fine, but lax enforcement means China averages 26 annual cable defects, the most of any state. This has precipitated a recent crackdown on activities like sand mining, drilling, anchoring, and bottom trolling. Ships suspected of breaking military cables have also been seized. China insists that the right to delineate cable routes across continental shelves rests with the coastal state. In practice, this means notifying the State Oceanic Administration and obtaining a letter of non-objection from the PLA Navy, sometimes resulting in rerouting. Only then can an operator apply for permission to land their cables on Chinese territory. Thereafter, they must keep maritime authorities fully informed of their activities. Yet this stance will likely cause friction, especially since Beijing argues that operators working within the Nine Dash Line, a purportedly historical claim to nearly the entire South China Sea, must seek its consent. Both Beijing and Taipei claim Chinese sovereignty over the sea, notwithstanding a 2016 judgment at the Permanent Court of Arbitration finding it unlawful. Getting permission to work on cables in the US is a complicated process. Companies have to ask for approval from different groups like the FCC, the Committee for the Assessment of Foreign Participation in the United States, the Army Corps of Engineers, and sometimes even state and local authorities. Dealing with all this paperwork can slow things down by about two years. It might take even longer if a new law that restricts sharing cable technology in America gets passed. There's a saying, laws are like sausages. It's better not to see them being made. By making strict rules for getting permission, both China and the US are not following a big international rule called the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. China agreed to follow this convention, and the US treats it like it's just a regular international law. But the rules they're making don't follow what the Law of the Sea says. For example, Article 79 of the Law of the Sea clearly says that every country can put cables on the ocean floor of the continental shelf. Article 112 goes even further and says that this applies to the high seas beyond the continental shelf. But the law of the sea has some problems too. It doesn't have good protection for these cables. The convention doesn't say that it's against the law to attack cables in the open ocean, and it doesn't make countries responsible for protecting cables in their own waters. If these problems aren't fixed all around the world, each country will have to figure out how to deal with them on their own that could lead to conflicts. These cables are like the world's highways for information, and right now, they're becoming a big part of the tension between China and the US. The cables being put in today will shape how the world works in the future. They will affect business, military strategy, and international laws. Right now, the West is ahead, but China is getting more powerful, and countries are working together in different groups, like BRICS. This could lead to new ways of working together on these cables. Whatever happens, promoting and protecting cable projects is now a geopolitical imperative because, while control of resources has long been a flashpoint for war, nowadays,
the focal point of conflict is the most precious resource of all information. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more weekly investment tips. Leave a comment below. Happy investing.